Thank you so much. Let me just pull up my screen share and start the presentation. Um, I, I just want to thank the um, organizers for um, inviting me to participate. I submitted an abstract under the futuristic theme um, and was delighted but somewhat surprised when um, it was accepted. So um, the title, Meet Lisa, the robot who stole your job, is inspired by a real life uh, lawyer robot that I'll introduce you to in a minute. But before then, um, just a little bit about myself and for those of you who are not in the legal profession, a little bit about uh, quite how um, perhaps uh, reluctant law has been to adapt to technology. So when I finished my LLB degree, fresh faced, I entered a, a large legal practice, one of the big um, sort of five in the country, and I arrived in my suit willing to take on exciting challenges. Of course, it wasn't suits, it was more like LA law back in the day that I had been watching. Um, and I expected to, of course, immediately jump into advising clients and researching briefs. And uh, the reality of what articles would entail was very different. Me and my colleague were sent down to the basement on day one. Um, and we were told that the law firm had an important task for us. Uh, there were a number of what the co a partner called dead files, which um, had not been indexed or archived. And we we're sitting in a, in, a, in a horrible mess at the bottom of the basement um, and had been for some years since they had moved from the center of town out to the ridge and our job would be to go through each and every file determine if the file could be shredded and re remove any documents that needed to be retained for safekeeping like original marriage certificates and create an, an index and register and needless to say for the many years I spent at the firm as I climbed the ranks monitoring uh, the dead file register <laughs> remained on my list of tasks. I was never able to convince anyone else to take it over. And the kind of mundane tasks uh, continued. Um, there are many things that lawyers do in their day-to-day -day running of a civil uh, or criminal litigation practice that are incredibly mundane. Um, and so one of my next tasks was to draw up what we would call um, in civil law, a discovery affidavit. And it literally is a list of every document or tape recording, um, which is an old fashioned word that today could include data files and, and digital um, files. But to create a list of all of those, indicating the name, the date, um, whether it's the original or a copy only, and to um, put that list into date order. So the task for this particular shipping matter that I was involved in took me a week. And I was billing, frankly, an outrageous hourly fee for doing something that seemed really um, utterly irrelevant to the five years I had spent studying for my LLB degree. So needless to say, there is massive scope in the law for automation. Um, and the buzzword at the moment is that AI will not replace lawyers, um, but lawyers who use AI, AI being of course artificial intelligence, will replace those who don't. Um, and so in my um, presentation, I've linked a couple of interesting reports on how AI has been used for things like case analysis, um, where lawyers traditionally would have gone uh, into the case reports. And of course, in South Africa alone, we have uh, two official sets of case reports, many other specialist sets of reports, unreported judgments available online. So it's a time consuming task. And if it's not done carefully and thoroughly, it's easy to miss an important case as our moot finalists discovered recently to their horror. Um, whoops. So whoopsie, whoopsie, what's happening there? Um, that task can quite easily be improved dramatically by using the new advances in deep learning and deep neural networks that are available to us um, in the, 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 the newer forms of complex AI. Um, robot lawyer Lisa, I've already mentioned, and many other productivity tools that are now being used routinely in law firms, um, including, I'm happy to say, tools which can automate 
an e-discovery process so that an unhappy articled clerk doesn't have to spend days and days sifting through paper to find out what's relevant and to categorize and alphabetize and order it in date order. Um, but of course, the other concern is around job loss and law traditionally relied on a huge measure of job security through reserved um, areas of the profession that have steadily been shrinking over the last two decades. Um, there was a time when you couldn't go anywhere to get a will but a lawyer. Now you can get one free at the touch of a button online. Um, there are so many tasks in relation particularly to tax and investment, legal advice that are now being handled um, by accountants and accounting firms. Um, and the list of growing areas of potential job loss um, is endless. So this is Lisa. I'm not sure if I have time to play you the video, but I'll give it a try. I'll just keep an eye on time. I think I have 10 minutes left. Might not work because my bandwidth is slow. I want to share the sound with you. Okay, that's not working very well. Sorry about that, but um, I've I've linked it in my in my presentation for you. Let's um, move to the next slide. <laughs> you see, Warren, you're not the only one that encounters technical difficulties. It happens to all of us. Um, so we should now, whoops, one second. Take your time, uh, Dr. Dastilib. It's uh, not the day for technology. It's tested it us endlessly. <laughs> uh, give me one more second. I'm sorry. I need to fix this share screen. Okay. So, um, Here we go. Some legal tasks can clearly be automated. There's a 2017 survey by McKinsey, which suggests that lawyers are fairly safe in this regard, while some jobs can be automated to almost 100%. Their, their estimate for what it's worth is that our jobs can be automated up to 20%. But there are many tasks that lawyers do that require higher order thinking skills, such as researching, but also drafting pleadings, um, which are documents filed at court setting out the client's claim and um, argument, which again um, is either crafted in writing or presented orally, and of course giving advice to clients, um, which at this stage machines cannot replicate. But we shouldn't let us, that lull us into a false sense of security as educators um, that it is business as usual. And so in this paper I'm going to argue for careful um, redesign of our module curriculum, the ways in which we deliver our teaching and the way in which we structure our assessments and what we assess. Um, and I want to introduce you to some of the pedagogical thinking behind this. If you're new to teaching in a blended or online format, I highly encourage you to explore the activated classroom teaching pedagogy, which I'm sharing on the screen. It was created by Dr. Craig Bluer to pursue his studies at UKZN. Um, and the pedagogy outlines, as you can see on the left, um, similar to a taxonomy, um, the lowest level of sort of knowledge creation being curation, where our students have to find uh, the relevant law, select or find the law, select what is relevant to the problem, arrange it in a logical order, perhaps amplify or give emphasis to the case that supports their client's argument. 
conversation where, um, as I was discussing with Warren, we need to engage continuously, even in an online environment, um, where we lead students through conversations of how to approach problems, but we also listen to them. And in listening to them, we can offer them a valuable format for them articulating their own developing um, sense of how to apply the law. And the third level, of course, is something we engage in regularly, correction. But in this new online environment where we've shifted to continuous assessment, we have a fantastic opportunity to really leverage the value of feedback by allowing students to um, fail on a low stakes um, formative assessment task and then learn from that mistake in adjusting how they learn, how they approach the problem, how they um, understand the material and then um, through persistence and, and, and risk taking, they can achieve success ultimately in that module by improving their performance um, and ultimately passing the module. But the two higher levels are the ones that I would submit we struggle with. Um, and that is where we set um, students tasks that require them to create documents. Um, and time permitting, I wanted to share with you an example of what we did in my undergraduate civil procedure course around drafting, um, where students actually had to um, approach a very complex real world problem. Uh, identify the correct parties, identify what document to draft and create the pleading. Um, and then of course, the final level, um, which takes it well beyond Bloom's taxonomy, uh, is to develop what Blewett calls a 21st century skill, but as I'll show you, it's actually much older than that, of metacognition and problem solving. And these are the areas where we must be designing curricula and um, assessments that require students to draw connections between disparate areas of, of knowledge rather than simply reproducing um, or rote learning. Um, so I don't have much time to touch on this, but Blewett's work covers older, um, uh, cover, builds on older work. So for example, in 1994, um, we saw a revision of Bloom's taxonomy by Anderson which included creation uh, on the right-hand side at the top of the pedagogy, but didn't include, as I've indicated, um, Blewett's uh, idea of chaos, navigating the real world of chaos um, that we must prepare our students for. Um, but it can also be linked, Blewett's pedagogical thinking about how we teach in an online environment can also be linked to earlier thinking in different contexts. Um, on the left of the screen, I'm showing you the philosopher and educational theorist Paulo Freire, who wrote um, on the pedagogy of oppression in the 1970s. And he said that liberating information, uh, education rather, I've got an error in the quote, liberating education consists in acts of cognition, not transferals of information. Um, but it goes uh, much, uh, the idea goes much earlier than that. Um, and I love this quote um, from the very beginning of um, sort of our, our philosophical origins um, with the Greek philosopher Plutarch. The mind does not require filling like a bottle, uh, but like wood only requires kindling to create an impulse to think independently and an ardent desire for truth. But of course, um, how do we achieve that um, and what will set us apart as human lawyers from artificial intelligence um, and how do we prepare our students for this new world? Um, now, one of the differentiating factors, at least presently, is what is called metacognition or briefly thinking about our thinking. Um, so it's a uniquely human quality in which we're aware of our own thought processes and we can understand and interrogate that. Um, currently, AI is unable to demonstrate metacognition. And even when we talk about AI, for those of you here who are not um, particularly familiar with the domain, we must distinguish um, at a very broad level between what you could call weak AI, um, which might still be an incredibly powerful computer um, using incredibly complex algorithms, but is essentially pre-programmed by a human to perform a predetermined set of calculation tasks. 
And we distinguish that from what is called strong AI, where complex algorithms powered by advances in natural language programming and machine learning or deep neural networks are enabling AI to operate um, with a much greater degree of independence um, to produce, um, to find patterns that perhaps weren't even anticipated by the developers in, um, in data that is being derived in real world contexts and to make decisions based on what it encounters. But currently even strong AI or artificial general intelligence is unable to demonstrate metacognition. So a lot of this thinking about how that must reshape the, the um, legal curriculum has been distilled already by um, a um, legal scholar, Amani Smavers, who's spoken about a new concept of the T-shaped lawyer. Now, the T-shaped lawyer will um, still need to have a deep and comprehensive knowledge of the law, um, knowledge of law and legal skills, such as case analysis, must continue to be taught and there's a um, deep uh, body of scholarship on how one approaches that task, although we obviously have to look at how we reimagine it in an online environment. But this goes even further. Um, it requires us to also recognize that if lawyers are going to remain successful and if as educators we are actually producing graduates with the required skills, legal knowledge and skills alone is not enough. We must be able to produce graduates who um, are comfortable with design thinking, are comfortable with elements of technology use, but also technology design and development um, with data, both data management and data security, um, and broader concepts around um, data analysis, business know-how, um, and even an element of project management and risk management are all becoming increasingly relevant factors that differentiate um, graduates who get employed and graduates who will not get employed. Um, so I will uh, just introduce you to one final model, which I won't discuss today, but it's called the Delta model that was introduced in 2018 by Runyon and Carroll which also suggests that again, within our curriculum, we have to find ways of introducing not just the law and not even just business and operational aspects related to technology and data, but also another unique differentiator of what it means to be human. And that is our ability to connect with other humans. So that personal effectiveness that comes from our ability to understand our own emotions and the emotions of others and mediate them in ways that make us good communicators is also a very important skill that we need to be developing in our graduates. And of course, there are those tech gurus who will tell you that robots are not far behind. They are busy in the healthcare environment where I'm researching on AI developing nurse aid robots that can recognize human emotions, sometimes more effectively even perhaps than a distracted, overworked um, nurse could. Um, but still the current consensus remains that this is another uniquely human skill that will um, bear out the adage at the beginning that I mentioned, AI won't replace lawyers, but lawyers who use AI will replace lawyers that don't. So I had uh, concluded my futuristic piece, uh, just to jump ahead a few slides to wrap up with a few thoughts. I think that we can um, probably anticipate some threats. Government policy, I'm sure we can agree, will likely be very slow to adapt. Even institutional policy and even within law schools themselves, I think that those of us who are driving for change will meet some resistance from those at the top. The LLB degree is likely, at least for the present purpose, to remain a gatekeeper for vocational training as a practicing lawyer. Um, and currently enrollments are high and that's likely to remain the case, but um, it might well change as public funding sources continue to dry up, as student dropout rates continue to remain high, and as the ranks of unemployed law graduates continue to swell. Um, I think we must also 
now is one final factor, which is that if online learning is to continue without adequate resourcing and support for staff um, and students, um, we are going to possibly see an exit of intellectual capital from academia. And there's a very interesting article recently um, in the Daily Maverick by Shorba, the journalist referenced there, on um, a study that has been conducted widely at 24 public universities on the extremely high rate of burnout that has been suffered by academics during this transition to remote emergency online teaching. I don't see that changing um, as we are actually called not just to transition to online teaching, we are being called um, to transition to online teaching in a radically different interdisciplinary structure, one in which our traditional curriculum needs to be supplemented in a variety of ways that are going to be new and very challenging. So I'm going to stop there. I think I have run over time and I apologize for that, um, but I hope that I have offered you some food for thought um, and that perhaps even in your disciplines, if you're not from law, I've offered you some food for thought about how your own disciplines are likely to be impacted by the changes that are on the way. Thank okay, thank you, Chair, for handing over. And I must say that I really am enjoying this present, the presentations today. Um, and it links quite nicely with what I will be uh, speaking about. So as you can see, this is our title and it's entitled The Journey to 4IR, which is known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution, equipping today's chemical engineering students for, uh, with, for, with skills for tomorrow's workplace. So this is what um, the team and I have been working on. And we are from different disciplines. So we are mixed with education as well as engineering. So how did we get here? So as I explained that we are on this journey, it's this journey that we found that ties in a lot with the fourth industrial revolution and it ties in a lot with COVID-19. So thinking about this, we would have met in person on uh, different circumstances, but due to COVID-19, as we've been hearing from the presentations from early until now, that COVID-19 has also played a role in this but it also ties in with the fourth industrial revolution because fourth industrial revolution actually moves things from physical domains where we would meet in person to now do things online. The same thing has occurred with teaching and learning, with lecturing, with uh, various things that we would do in person, we can now even bank online. So there's plenty of things that we've now moved from physical domains to now digital domains. So where are we going? So when you look at this, uh, these two images here, in 2015, if we have a look at the top 10 skills, they have changed drastically now in 2020. When we look at the skill, for example, of creativity, which is number 10 in 2015, but when we compare it to 2020, it has actually moved up in ranks, which is now uh, it has now been listed as number three. When we look at the right and we say the top 10 skills of 2025, so this is what we're predicting will occur in the future years. We can see that there's a whole list of new skills that are coming to the fore. There's analytical thinking, uh, complex problem solving. Things are definitely changing and going to continue changing, not only with COVID-19, but also with the fourth industrial revolution. So with that being said, what do we need to consider? So as um, the previous speakers before me have been talking about um, student-centered learning and moving forward uh, with things that are changing within our world and our country and even the different professions, um, we need the youth to stay relevant and competitive. So if we are going to be teaching them the same thing that we've always been teaching them, they're not going to be learning anything new or adapting to the new practices or the new things that are going to be taking place in our digital world. So we then say that higher education curricula needs to be transformed. So we need to change it so that it works for uh, each student and it works that they are able to contribute something positively to our, to our economy, to our world at large. 
With that being said, there's also critical voices. So some op occupations are going to change dramatically or become obsolete. As we've just heard in the previous uh, presentation by Dr. Donnelly that she spoke about uh, some robots um, now speaking about uh, speaking to patients' emotions. And sometimes in, in some of the countries, we've seen that they've now been learning to administer medication and that. So uh, a lot of the decline would be in also the manufacturing and administration sect uh, sectors. So there are critical voices that it, with fourth industrial revolution having benefits, there are also some downsides to it that they, the automation may leave some people unemployed. So what does this mean for engineering? So as I've mentioned that there is going to be a decline in the manufacturing sector as things now uh, change, moving to online, more machine op operated instead of by people. So engineering is already affected by the fourth industrial revolution with all the changes that are now occurring. So we've heard about artificial intelligence, robotics, and these uh, types of machines or the new types of things that are going to be happening are obviously going to require specific skills or sp skill sets from engineers. So we can't be doing the things that we used to do before. We have to now transform our thinking to gain more skills to operate efficiently. So there are some initiatives to move in this direction as we are also trying to in, be part of this change that we want to see within the engineering field. So the engineering uh, curriculum needs to be adaptive to the fourth industrial revolution. It also needs to consider um, the societal changes as well as the economic changes and things that happen within our country. So we need to move away from the ways in which we've been working already. So the current curricula and what they've been testing and assessing and now adapt to the changes around us. So I think COVID-19 as well as also pushed us closer within this uh, fourth in, uh, 4IR um, domain. So we also heard in the um, Mr. Warren's uh, um, presentation where he spoke about uh, more student-centered curriculum. So moving away from what uh, we used to do and what the, the curriculum tells us to do currently to now making it more student-centered so they're learning and it's more hands-on. So the student has that within their hand and they are learning and bringing thing, new skills as well that could assist everyone. Okay, so some objectives for this project. So we are going to be looking at which, skill, which four IR skills do future chemical engineers need. So there are other objectives that we have within this project and we are still trying to build on. But for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'll just be focusing on this one main objective. So to see which skills that uh, future chemical engineers need in order to be successful within our um, country and our world at large. Okay, so when we went through our uh, work, we did a literature review and we started this earlier this year in March 2021. And as I mentioned that it is different authors or different people from different fields of education as well as um, chemical engineering. So we are using a mixed method design and we used a scoping literature review. So we went through uh, the Web of Science um, application and we went searching through the words for IR, Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, for our industry, industry 4.0 and skills. And so we checked about the different publications and the search links that can be found under this database. And we found a, a, a host of different types of uh, publications that came with this. So we entered this into the, uh, the end note and we came up with a network analysis, which is going to be displayed uh, shortly. So we came up with a lot of publications that people spoke about. Um, now we see that it's now a buzzword, the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. All these terms are actually used interchangeably for the fourth industrial revolution. So we wanted to tie it in with skills and see what do other countries or what do authors say regarding this. So some of the results that we came up with, we saw that the uh, 4IR skills are definitely increasing in uh, receiving attention. So we're seeing that there are plenty of people that are writing or searching about this. 
and they want to know more about the fourth industrial revolution and the skills. South Africa is also contributing to this body, as you can see in figure two on the right. And we can see that it, even though it's a developing country, it, is, it has many publications that it has um, produced compared to even the USA, it is actually leading. So we see that definitely there is, um, South Africa is making some efforts into moving towards the fourth industrial revolution. And another important thing that we came up with was that we saw that these results, we, show, we, we saw that engineering is contributing a lot to this. So there's a lot of um, debates, there's a lot of authors that are writing about what does uh, chemical engineering and the different types of engineering, as you can see, there's manufacturing, industrial engineering, they're all contributing and they all uh, plenty of publications regarding this and the fourth industrial revolution and skills. So we can see that engineering is actually leading in the um, image on the right. We can see the figure that engineering is actually the highest on that list. So it shows us that engineering and the fourth industrial revolution skills are actually becoming something that is very important within our world. Okay, here is the network analysis that I said um, we did scoping the literature review for. And when you look at this, you can see that there's different clusters of authors. So firstly, when we put it in um, into this VLS view, it actually became, it was very difficult for us to view it, uh, something difficult for also to, for someone else to understand or to, if I put it here, it's difficult to explain it. So we actually extracted this and we saw that there's different types of different clusters of authors. So you can see that the green represents the Czech Republic or the red uh, authors around red is um, Korea. So there's different clusters of authors and it showed that um, these authors are writing about the fourth industrial revolution and they're writing about uh, the chemical engineering or engineering as well. But we noticed that there were few linkages with other countries. So they were, if you are writing that like, there's a lot of authors from a specific uh, country. So this was actually something that we tried to do, which is quite difficult to display if we uh, displayed the original one. Okay, and then we further broke it down and it's our original um, figure looked something like more the one on the left, but more intricate with more um, spirals and lots of uh, little writing around it. But what's important to notice here is that the industry 4.0 and the fourth industrial revolution is a word that is now often used interchangeably. So when we look at the industry 4.0, if you can see that it's mostly around blue, which is the internet of things, big data, those types of things. And when we look at the fourth industrial revolution, it's more dealing with the higher education or education sphere that we notice that fourth industrial revolution is a word or the term that is usually used in um, the education sector. So upon doing that uh, analysis, what we came up with, which was the most important um, aspect, is looking at the different types of skills and a specific focus on the engineering skills or needed uh, skills needed for future engineers. So things like um, reasoning or synthesizing information or process modeling or IT skills, those are things that, those are skills that um, engineers have been using for a long time and they've been using it con continuously in their uh, sphere. But when we look at things like environmental awareness and uh, specialized software use, we see that they are new skills that are coming to the fore that maybe our current um, skills are, or our current uh, curriculum is not preparing our students for. So we are actually in the process of analyzing all of the curriculum documents, looking at what is it that is being tested, what is it that is there, and what is it that we can also assist to um, equip our graduates so that they are efficiently uh, contributing to our country. When we look at these different um, levels here, we've got future work skills, future of work skills, and then we can see that they are branched off into education, 
business and finance. So when we look at these other skills, now with these changes, as I've mentioned in, earlier on in my presentation, that there's already been a shift from 2015 to 2020 with the skills fluctuating. Some skills have been removed completely. Some new skills have come to the fore. Some have moved up in rank so that something that was number 10 is now number one. So with all of this being said, we see that these changes are constantly happening. There's always a need for more skills. And as things are going to change, like we said, we're always trying to reach a certain mark. There's, always, there's going to be something else that we are lacking. So with cognitive load management, for example, or design mindset or a virtual collaboration like we are doing right now, we need to see how are these skills also going to come to the fore? Because they, they are obviously going to be mixing with the engineering sector. And how is it that we can use this within the engineering field to even uh, collaborate with people that are abroad in other countries? So clearly we can see that these skills are definitely going to be used interchangeably and we need to check if the engineering sector will be able to accommodate these. So- Three um, minutes to wrap up. Thank you. So we've also got digitalization things that we are currently doing now. And we know that these types of things are going to be working across the engineering field. So we want to know um, how can we uh, properly or efficiently equip our graduates. Okay, so what we do know is that workplaces are going to change fundamentally, not only in the engineering, but now we've even heard it from law and other fields. So we, we know that there are definitely new skills and competencies that are going to be required. So there are going to be a shift in skills of what uh, we were doing to what we will be doing. And uh, for our art and engineering definitely do go hand in hand. So it's, uh, it's, uh, for us, we are trying to identify the necessary skills that are currently being taught, what is going to be needed for the future of engineers and how can we successfully equip engineers. Um, so we also see that there may be different types of skills that engineers may need as the years change. Currently, they need something else, but now we will be moving and all these skills may work interchangeably. So the role of higher education institutions is to prepare graduates in engineering for the fourth industrial revolution. And we want to, in terms, as we are now pro progressing with our project, we want to not only limit it to our institution as we're doing it at a specific institution, our study, we want to now come up with some blueprint that would be able to um, assist other engineering uh, disciplines and be used in other STEM disciplines, not just uh, one specific uh, firm. Okay, that is all from us. You could feel free to contact us on our following email addresses. Thank you very much. For reality education, a potential catalyst to the next stage of the evolving pedagogy. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well and are keeping safe. Um, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to say that I have been really enjoying this uh, conference. It is my first time here and I've learned so much so far. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce, my, introduce myself. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Tam and I studied at the University of the Free State and I am the first author of this paper. So a little background about me from a young age, I have already shared a connection with my father for his love for IT. Um, he, like my mother, are immigrants and English wasn't their first language, which made doing homework uh, together quite difficult. So to try and help me, they adopted a more visual teaching method um, because pictures and colors is a universal language. So this got me thinking as to what other issues um, are South African families experiencing with the education system and can IT be used to, to alleviate these issues? Okay, and this is just the agenda for today. Okay. So it is apparent that the poor basic education system in South Africa has harmed our economy. If the education system continues to deteriorate at this rate, future South Africans will remain stagnant and lack the expertise and knowledge needed to survive the future technological global economy. Teachers are unable to keep a learner's attention for long periods of time while learners have difficulty in comprehending the work that is being taught to them. 
The current traditional education system does not accommodate a child's dynamic learning abilities and promotes the belief that the only ticket to success is based on the grades you achieve at school. So this paper aimed to determine whether the use of um, emerging techniques and technologies, particularly virtual reality, has the potential to alleviate current issues uh, present within teaching and learning practices. So through expert reviews and a usability uh, study conducted on a newly created virtual reality prototype, we investigated the plausibility of the incorporation of virtual reality within the South African primary um, education system. So the research question was, how can virtual reality be incorporated as an additional teaching and learning tool in the primary school education in South Africa? So um, to investigate this, we go through a brief review of literature. So what is virtual reality and virtual environments? So virtual reality is the state of experience something, experiencing something that is comparable to reality, whereas the virtual environment is the artificial space in which users are immersed and can navigate and interact with objects within this simulated environment. What is the role of technology in education? So education is no longer bound to a classroom. The internet and electronic devices have made online education possible for people from all walks of life with a passion to learn. Um, IT allows people to learn in a more dynamic manner instead of being bound to the outdated pen and paper way of learning. So according to Dale's cone of experience, people retain information more effectively through what they do than through what they have heard or seen. Um, the multimedia cone of abstraction, which was proposed as an updated version of Dale's cone of experience due to um, growing inclusion of multimedia within the learning context. So as we can see here, virtual reality um, occupies the bottom section of the cone while symbols occupy at the top. The use of the cone in both um, designs suggests that concepts that occupy the bottom section of the cone have a likelihood of being more, uh, more effective learning techniques for more learners in comparison to the top sections, where fewer learners have the ability of processing information in these formats. Okay, so over time, teaching and learning has undergone a significant evolution from paper-based education to online education, which promotes a more active learning environment. Our virtual reality education, although still in its infancy, promotes, um, um, promotes learning through experiences and has an active learning environment in, and encourages a more holistic education. Uh, virtual reality is highly beneficial for developing countries such as South Africa because it provides a diverse learning solution and can potentially amend the inequality gap present uh, within the South African education system. So through this assessment of literature, the researchers believe that the potential for virtual reality in contributing to the evolving pedagogy is commendable. So to critically assess the potential for virtual reality within education, a virtual reality education prototype with its focus on the photosynthesis process was created and evaluated by a target population. An agile methodology approach was used when creating the prototype. Uh, technology used would be the Oculus Rift, which is the virtual reality headsets and Unity Engine to develop the prototype. The theme used for the prototype was more of a cartoon-like style um, because this is quite a, quite a prominent style in the South African CAPS textbook. Okay, uh, the prototype presented the photosynthesis process as discussed above. Um, the lesson consisted of four main concepts. So participants would immerse into the virtual garden called Scienceville and were required to complete uh, the following tasks. Um, so they had to water the plant, so they had to pick up the watering can and go to the plant and physically water it in this virtual environment. Um, and then it would, once the learner 
completed this task, they will be prompted to the next task where the learner would need to grab sunlight elements from above and place them into the chlorophyll characters um, that are on the leaves. Then it would prompt to the next um, task, which would be carbon dioxide, where this task required the learners to grab the carbon dioxide particles in the air and place them inside the stomata that can be found on top of the leaf. But the final step would require the learners to consolidate all the information that they gained from the previous tasks um, to help them complete the photosynthesis equation. Right, so this next slide is just a short video of how the prototype looked like once you've immersed into the virtual environment. Okay, sorry about that. Um, evaluation methods. So an expert review and usability test was conducted to test the prototype. So this is what happened throughout the testing process. So the testing of the prototype was spread across 11 days to allow for the test facilitators to clean and sanitize the testing areas since we will be testing on children and we don't want uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we didn't want to put their lives at risk. So during each test section, participants had to complete the four tasks as mentioned above. Um, so task success and task time metric were measured during the testing session. Um, expectation measure was also measured during the usability test. And while testing the prototype, participants were also asked to think aloud. Uh, after completing the testing, participants were asked to answer a paper-based multiple choice assessment. Um, participants were additionally asked to rate their experience about this potentially new learning method. Analysis and discussion of the results. Um, so with task success, most participants were able to complete the tasks without any assistance or complete the task but needed some sort of assistance from the moderator. Time per task, uh, most of the participants completed each task within the mean time range uh, with only one or two outliers in task two and task four. These outliers coincided with the task success data where there were a few participants who required some help from the moderator to complete the task. Assessment marks and overall ratings, 72% of the participants scored over 70% for the assessment. Um, all participants gave incredibly positive satisfaction ratings with only uh, one participant giving a rating of four out of five. All participants commented on how cool the experience was and stated that they really enjoyed learning differently. Um, expectation measure, the result of the expectation measure were um, between the promote it and don't touch it quadrant. This reveals that although there is room for improvement, participants found the tasks relatively easy. Although there is need for enhancements, the evaluation of the prototype revealed that there is great potential for the incorporation of virtual reality within the education system. This aligns with the statement that virtual reality has the power to improve how learning concepts are taught to learners and allow them to experience and take charge of their education. Um, some contributions. Um, this research um, provides proof that the incorporation of virtual reality within the education system could potentially eradicate the current issues experienced within teaching and learning. These types of technology, technologies could be leveraged to bring about growth and promote, promote individualism within child learning. Um, some limitations is that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, 
it was quite difficult to acquire test participants who were willing and had the consent of their parents and guardians was also quite difficult. Um, future work um, would be parameters of the subject that is presented by the uh, VR education system could be expanded in future. Um, so using like different subjects or a lot more uh, such as um, call formation, etc. Um, and although the use of technology in education has increased in response to the challenges presented uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, future research should also investigate whether the South African education system has adequate resources to combat the ever-growing digital divide that exists within the education sector. Uh, so some key takeaways um, from this uh, paper is that society has raised a digitally literate generation and with the COVID-19 pandemic necessitating the need for innovative teaching and learning methods, according to this paper, virtual reality education is quite promising. Therefore, in order to solve issues in teaching and learning practices, more time and resources need to be used in incorporating new technologies within education, with virtual reality being a very good candidate. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Good afternoon from Ghana. We are very sorry for the hiccup because our browser was updating. I am Clement Ali, and my co-presenter is Peter Akayura. We are presenting on the topic that Datis has evolved to digital age didactics. Can we? Our focus of the study, we have review the various stages that the data has moved from pre data stage to our current stage. pre data was at the instance where the primary focus was on as culture curriculum. Then the, the, it moved to the dialectics where reading and other special works were very, very important. Classroom work at those days was just a matter of and learning the art of teaching. But when we later on move into the next stage called the traditional didactics, then we then introduced the concept of teaching and learning in science. So it was then called the scientific teaching and learning. Today, our focus now has moved into digital didactics, meaning teaching through the ICT-based artifacts. And we do that on the internet. Can we move to the next stage? Thank you. The relevance of this work has several dimensions from the university here as lecturers to the outside world. In this university, we run three modes. That is regular where students come to campus for three, four months, we have the distance for weekends, I mean, for weekends, and then we have the sandwich when regulars are on holiday. As early as the early 2000s, we have started doing things on the internet on this digital artifact. So this particular theory that we are using today has been propelled by the uh, uh, introduction of this blended learning that we have to do with face-to-face -face because of the instance of COVID-19. So currently, assessment is actually undertaken on the B class. That is one of the platforms for our uh, uh, learning management system. All these have contributed so much. In the wider context, we will see that that data has actually helped in the theory of Vygotsky. According to Pesana, this theory has been divided into two. That is the ZPF and then the ZPA, which actually interact to bring about interaction on the social uh, aspect of internet work, especially didactics. ZPA describes the efforts of the experienced learner if he's able to develop skills, and then ZPD actually looks at how the mathematics pedagogy and the belief can be transformed into ICT-based learning. Can we go to the next? That's why we Next slide, please.
Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah so um, methodology. Please, can we go back a little to the steady setting? All right, so we, our steady setting, as uh, Dr. Clementa Lee said, is uh, University of Education. We looked at uh, basic education students, they are student teachers. We focus on uh, 168 um, students. And the students, what we did was to introduce them to the B class, which is uh, the university management uh, learning system. And our focus was to help them to gather data regarding how they can teach using various uh, ICT system and how they can gather information from the planning stage of teaching to the delivery part. And our emphasis was about uh, the uh, women in science. And so we had a um, group, the student into 10, and then each student was required to create an album in a soft copy manner. And then those who are not able to do that, they will have a hard copy of the artifact of uh, personalities in science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics in, in, in the internet. And then they can laminate them, showing the progression of how uh, teaching and learning can be done. So that if you have those materials, they can use them for teaching and learning purposes. So we engage them in creating an album. And then we had all the teaching, learning, and assessment was done, as I said, through the investment management system. We had what we call the blue button, which uh, is responsible for video conferencing. So we also involved them in that. This is their first time of using it. So there were a lot of issues relating to how we can do that. But our emphasis was to see how the student teachers move from their traditional didactic stage to digital age didactics. In other words, how they can transition from what they know in the traditional sense into the uh, use of ICT to gather information, to plan and to deliver lessons. So our data were collected through classroom observation. We had formal and informal interviews and then we gather their works that based on the local policy documents. We have our course outlined, and then we're also gathered by the university uh, in, uh, ICT policy. So different data were later processed and analyzed for the purpose of interpreting the student interaction with uh, ICT system in, 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 in our LMS system. So we, we, we had different um, observations from different perspectives. And the main tools that the students used were smartphones, laptops, and they have the uh, desktop computers. And then they also applied smart, um, um, smart cal calculators. They, there were various tools that gave us uh, rich information regarding this particular uh, study. Next. Next slide. Ah, that's the next slide. Yes. So our analysis were basically based on three, uh, four aspects. Um, we have the dissemination, discussing, discovery, and demonstration. And Dr. Ali will continue with that. Thank you very much. The general assessment framework was for learning as learning, and uh, participants were engaged in the process and experience other things that could even make them create more things on the internet. In fact, we try to observe certain level of ethical principles, openness to them, uh, uh, orderliness, partiality, and others. We try to also review some of the UN decisions. So our results, yes, next, our results, as we, we have seen over there, we have just taken an example. If some can see us with a lot of this, we didn't uh, want to, do so my bio we had produced a lot of this album from the students. If you see, if you, want to help, if you can see, you see the African female contributor, so many work to science and technology, but 
most of them as uh, Peter read over, if you saw the data of the distribution, you see that that particular class is being dominated by females. And that is the most important thing that we wanted them to also emulate as future scientists. One group has discovered a particular person called Hapatia, the Alexandra. This particular person contributed so much in mathematics. And uh, according to them, he hailed from Egypt, one part of Africa. We have somebody like um, Maram Adi. In fact, in Ghana, he's one of the most important female scientists that one can acknowledge throughout our history, even though we have many others. Most of the people that we also saw or uh, witnessed from our students came from South Africa. We have a personality like Regina Panken and so on. If you look at the album, we have so many South Africans there who made history in this particular regard. So we're so happy that students were able to discover it through the e the that is lessons. Next slide, please. So our key planning, the planning stage, the participants were able to divide the strategies and download, and that was very important because for the first time, most of our students were not used to the school management, I mean, the internet platform. So when we, they were able to do this, we uh, were very sure that at least they have achieved a lot of learning. Teaching and learning majority was able to also do much on the teaching and learning because they were able to take the materials, take, go to the online, and then explain how they got the materials and how others can also do to get them. They also used so many uh, uh, skills, particularly to discover, create, and innovate, because some of the things that we have seen, they have actually done so much to transform what was in the internet to what we have seen in the albums. Then another finding was the use of the platform itself. The participants developed research skills and critical thinking because it wasn't actually easy for them to come out with the creation of so many of these particular artifacts. And the history behind the discoveries and the, the value of those discoveries to the development of women and other people in Africa was a great thing to us. Participation was so good in that particular class, and we hope that as we go along in future lessons, we we'll even attain much more than we did. Next, please. So, conclusion: digital didactics was very suitable for our design and our use and teaching for uh, assessment. It also helped us have a lot of innovation as it motivated the learners to make more research about the females who have achieved so much in science and technology. The platform also helped them to produce more books and other instructional design. In fact, other things that they came out with and with the way we can do to discover things on the internet was so marvelous that it was a good model for us. It also promoted collaboration and independent work, problem solving, because for the first time, they were able to do things on their own and to come and then compare with what other groups have done and share their experiences to us on both internet and then face-to-face. Uh, -face. It also helped them to get varied materials, online resources necessary for uh, this uh, assessment. We have come out with a new assessment in Ghana called Assessment for Assessment as an Assessment of Criteria. So when they were doing it, we tried to link this Through this, our methodology, we experienced that the students who are student teachers, if they are able to actually create albums of various instructional processes and artifacts, they can share these things with their students in future, and they can easily transition from the traditional mode of instruction to the online mode, because they have all these um, albums in their soft copy form, and this can uh, promote further uh, ICT integration in the teaching and learning process. Because we know in Ghana, issues relating to integrating ICT still remains a problem. So training student teachers by introducing them into the uh, digital didactics can facilitate the integration process. And so we feel that it's one of the key ways of training student teachers.
Thank you very much.